Hi everyone, we're talking about a Clostridium difficile or C. diff infection in this lesson. So we're going to talk about risk factors for getting this infection. We will also talk about the pathophysiology behind how and why this causes infection and illness in patients. And then we will talk about the signs and symptoms, how it's diagnosed and how it's treated. So Clostridium difficile or C. diff is now known as Clostridioides difficile. So this is the newer term for this particular condition. But from now on, we will refer to this particular bacteria as C. diff. It is a gram-positive bacillus bacteria that causes gastrointestinal illness. And this gastrointestinal illness is often termed as a C. difficile infection or C. difficile colitis, colitis being inflammation of the colon. This particular bacteria is a spore-forming bacteria and it is anaerobic. Now there are several different strains of this particular bacteria. We are not going to talk about all the strains in this lesson, but I do want to mention one here and that is known as the NAP1 strain. And the reason I bring this up is because this NAP1 strain is a more virulent strain that causes a more severe clinical presentation. So it causes more severe illness in patients. So I do want to mention that here. Now, although C. diff can cause gastrointestinal illness, it may be part of the normal gut flora in some patients. So in some patients, it can reside in the gastrointestinal tract without causing illness. We are going to talk about this later on when we discuss the pathophysiology. Nevertheless, this type of bacteria is an important cause of enterotoxic, non-inflammatory acute diarrhea. So acute diarrhea is going to be a diarrhea that occurs for less than two weeks, although it could lead to a chronic diarrhea in some cases, so a diarrhea that occurs greater than two to four weeks. C. diff is actually one of the most common nosocomial infections. So nosocomial meaning that it is an infection that occurs in hospital. So it's one of the most common hospital acquired infections, and it is an important cause of antibiotic associated diarrhea. Now let's talk about the risk factors for getting a C. diff infection. As we just talked about, it is an important cause of antibiotic-associated diarrhea, and in fact, recent antibiotic use is going to be the major risk factor for getting a C. diff infection. And recent antibiotic use can mean within the past three months. So it could be that a patient has taken an antibiotic even up to 10 to 12 weeks earlier, and they start to have diarrhea that could be a C. diff infection. There are particular antibiotics that are more likely to cause a C. diff infection, and these include clindamycin. Clindamycin is going to be the major one here. Cephalosporins are also a culprit, and particularly second and third generation cephalosporins. Fluoroquinolones and amoxicillin and other penicillins have also been shown to increase the risk of a C. diff infection. These are going to be the main culprits, but many other different antibiotics can increase the risk of C. diff as well. Recent hospital admission is also another important risk factor for getting a C. diff infection. We mentioned that this is one of the most common nosocomial infections. And the recent hospital admission has a more specific definition of the C. diff infection occurring 48 hours or more after hospitalization. Long-term care patients are also at an increased risk as well. So because they are in a shared environment with many other older patients, they can also be at risk for acquiring C. diff and having a C. diff infection. Elderly patients are at a higher risk for having C. diff infections as well. Being immunosuppressed, so having a suppressed immune system is another risk factor. So we can see this in cancer patients, patients on chemotherapy or other immunosuppressant agents, and patients with diabetes. Patients with gastrointestinal anomalies are also at an increased risk for having an infection with C. diff as well. And then there are some other potential risk factors for having a C. diff infection, including PPI or proton pump inhibitor use. So this can include pentoprazole, which is used for GERD. This has been associated with a potential increase in C. diff infection rates. And then having certain chronic medical conditions like chronic renal disease and chronic liver disease have also been shown to increase the risk of having a C. diff infection as well. And then there have been other associated risk factors, including use of certain antidepressants, including fluoxetine and mirtazapine. These have also been shown to have an association with an increase in C. diff infections. Now, a lot of those risk factors are often summed up in this particular scenario where there's an older patient who has an infection, they go to their doctor's office, they receive antibiotics for that particular infection, and then one month later, they end up in hospital due to some other reason. They end up getting C. difficile in the hospital. 
A couple days later, they end up in another facility or they end up going home and they start to have diarrhea. And then they end up back at the clinic or back at the hospital. So this is oftentimes going to be example scenario that can fit many different patients, especially older patients who end up going in hospitals and clinics for other reasons. Now let's talk about how a C. diff infection occurs. So here is the inside of the intestine. So we have villi and these microvilli and the intestine has gut flora, so normal healthy bacteria within the intestine. Now if C. difficile comes along, which again may be part of normal gut flora in some patients, and in this particular scenario it would be an asymptomatic carrier, this particular scenario of having an asymptomatic carrier likely occurs in roughly 3% of the general population, but in other patients it likely comes from a fecal oral transmission. So what happens in a C. diff infection is that there is disruption of normal gut flora for some reason. And the main culprit here is going to be antibiotics. So if there are antibiotics that are being used for another reason, they can disrupt the bacteria within the gastrointestinal system. C. difficile then either colonizes or starts to grow in patients who already have it. So some patients already have it in their gastrointestinal tract and it starts to grow and outcompete these other normal gut flora that have essentially died off from antibiotic use, or the patient is newly colonized with C. difficile. And then because, again, the normal gut flora, which oftentimes keeps bad bacteria in check, because of that disruption in normal gut flora, C. difficile starts to multiply and grow even more. And these growing and multiplying populations of C. difficile then start to release exotoxins, and these exotoxins are named exotoxin A and B. So C. difficile releases these exotoxins, and these exotoxins lead to subsequent mucosal inflammation and damage. So it damages the mucosa within the gastrointestinal tract, and that is going to lead to a lot of the signs and symptoms we're going to talk about in the upcoming slides. Now let's talk about the signs and symptoms of a C. diff infection or C. diff colitis. So the major symptom is going to be watery diarrhea. Diarrhea is an increase in frequency of bowel movements or a decrease in consistency of bowel movements over a 24 hour period. Oftentimes it's going to be three or more episodes. And again, it's going to be watery. We're not going to see a bloody diarrhea occurring. Although it can occur in some patients, it's going to be very rare. This doesn't necessarily mean that there will be no blood in the stool. It could be occult blood, so a hidden blood, a very small amount of microscopic blood may be in the stool from that mucosal inflammation. This particular diarrhea is again going to be an acute diarrhea, so occurring for less than two weeks, although as I mentioned before, it can become chronic, so it can last longer than two to four weeks, especially if the patient has been treated. And another very important characteristic of this particular diarrhea is that it is very foul smelling. So very smelly, very stinky. So the diarrhea from a C. diff infection has this particular smell. And if a patient is admitted to hospital, oftentimes nursing staff are some of the first to notice this smell. Abdominal pain is also another important clinical feature. So abdominal pain that occurs in the lower quadrants, so in the lower abdomen. And this is oftentimes going to be a cramping pain. Some patients may have nausea and vomiting, although that's going to be less likely than some of these other signs and symptoms we talked about before. They can also have anorexia, meaning that they just have no appetite, they don't want to eat, and they can also have malaise, just having this general feeling of being unwell. And then there can be some severe symptoms that can occur in some patients, and these are going to be red flags for a more severe presentation of a C. difficile infection. These include diffuse abdominal pain, and oftentimes that pain can be severe, abdominal tenderness and abdominal distension. So the abdomen starts to expand outward. These are again going to be red flags for a more serious or more severe complication from a C. diff infection, which we will talk about in the next slide. So there are other features that can occur with a C. diff infection. We're going to talk about some of those, including blood work and vital signs and complications that can occur. So some blood work that can be found to be abnormal in a C. difficile infection include leukocytosis. So leukocytosis is a high white blood cell count, so high leukocyte count. So if it is greater than 15 times 10 to the 9 cells per liter, this is oftentimes going to be something that can be noted with more severe infections. Hypoalbuminemia can also occur, so a low albumin level in the blood. So hypoalbuminemia can be due to a protein-losing enteropathy. So in more severe cases of a C. diff infection, patients can have excretion of albumin from their gastrointestinal tract. And then in other severe cases, there can be high creatinine levels.
A fever can be something that can occur in a C. diff infection, but oftentimes it's going to be low grade. If it's a higher fever, that's going to be more indicative of a more severe clinical presentation of this condition. And then there are particular complications that can occur. So because of that fluid loss from excessive diarrhea, there can be dehydration and hypovolemia. This can lead to a pre-renal acute kidney injury, and this is the reason why we can see high creatinine occurring. There can also be peripheral edema or anasarca. So anasarca is edema in many different parts of the body, including the upper extremities, lower extremities, and oftentimes the abdomen as well. The reason why peripheral edema or anasarca may occur is because of the loss of albumin in more severe cases. So that hypoalbuminemia can lead to peripheral edema or anasarca. Some more severe and serious complications include colonic perforation and peritonitis. So with these particular complications, a patient can have diffuse abdominal pain and rebound tenderness. An ileus can occur in some patients. Pseudomembranous colitis is also another clinical presentation of C. diff that we will show and talk about when we talk about diagnosing a C. diff and cell infection. And then fulminant colitis is going to be a severe case of a C. difficile infection. So it is a diffuse, severe abdominal pain with abdominal distension. Oftentimes we'll have hypovolemia and some of these other findings as well. And then the fulminant colitis can lead to some of these complications we just talked about, including clonic perforation and peritonitis. And then there can also be toxic megacolon where there is this toxic acute state of the colon where there's an expansion or a dilatation of the colon. So this leads into the severity of a C. difficile infection. C. difficile often is broken down into mild to moderate to severe. And then in another category I don't show here, but we could consider fulminant colitis and toxic megacolon as very severe cases. In a mild C. diff infection, the patient mostly only has diarrhea. So that is oftentimes the only symptom that occurs in a mild C. diff infection. And in moderate C. diff, there can often be diarrhea plus other signs and symptoms that we talked about before. There may be some nausea, there may be some vomiting. So those can be some other potential signs and symptoms. But there's not going to be complications of severe C. diff. It's not going to have those complications we're going to talk about here when we talk about severe C. diff. In severe C. difficile infection, we have hypoalbuminemia, so low albumin level. We have leukocytosis, very high white blood cell count. We have high creatinine due to dehydration and a potential prerenal AKI. A fever, so a fever greater than 38.5 degrees Celsius and abdominal tenderness. So these are all going to be things that can be seen in severe cases. And then in other cases like fulminant C. diff colitis, we can see issues with abdominal distension and possible complications like clonic perforation. Now, certain C. diff infections can be categorized and defined as complicated C. diff infections. And in these scenarios, oftentimes complicated C. diff infections may require ICU admission. So complicated C. diff infections are going to have hypotension, so low blood pressure, even with vasopressors, a fever greater than 38.5 Celsius, very high white blood cell count, serum lactate greater than 2.2 to 5 millimole per liter, ileus, abdominal distension, and altered mental status as well. So all of these are things that would be under the classification as complicated C. diff infection. And there is another type of C. difficile infection I will mention here as well, which is known as recurrent C. difficile infection. And as its name implies, it is after a patient has already had an episode of C. difficile and then they have another episode. So that would be considered recurrent C. diff infection. The rate of recurrence is actually generally quite high. It can occur in 20 to 40% of patients and it often occurs three days to three weeks after the first episode. So after the first episode of a patient having treatment and having their C. diff infection resolved, three days to three weeks later, they could have another episode of a C. diff infection. And in fact, having the first episode of a recurrence increases the risk of having even more C. diff infections later. So this is another type of C. diff infection that's going to be important to have defined when we talk about ways of treating C. diff later on in this lesson. Now let's talk about how clinicians diagnose a C. diff infection. Clinical suspicion is going to be very important in diagnosing a C. diff infection. So seeing that the patient has diarrhea and they had antibiotics prior to that diarrhea, even up to three months before, is going to be an important clue. And recent hospitalizations is also going to be another important clue in thinking about C. diff as a potential cause of 
diarrhea in patients. And we're going to go through a large list of diagnostic methods to determine if a patient has a C. diff infection. But it's important to note that clinicians should only test for C. diff in patients with diarrhea. As I mentioned before, some patients are asymptomatic carriers. So if they are asymptomatic and have no symptoms, they may still test positive for C. diff. So again, these tests should only be used in patients with diarrhea or symptoms. One way of diagnosing C. diff is by stool culture, but this takes some time to get results. Another way is by what is known as a glutamate dehydrogenase or GDH enzyme immunoassay. And another way is by a stool PCR to detect C. diff toxins. And then clinicians can also use a stool immunoassay for C. diff toxins as well. And so those are going to be some of the highlights of the diagnostic methods for C. diff, but there are some other important things that a clinician should look out for, including some blood work like a CBC, so a complete blood count to see if they have a high white blood cell count. Electrolytes should also be noted. There can be electrolyte imbalances with a C. diff infection. Creatinine, because as I mentioned before, there can be high levels of creatinine due to a potential acute kidney injury. Albumin should also be noted. There may be hypoalbuminemia. And then lactate levels should also be noted as well, because this may be a sign of a more severe clinical presentation. And with regards to a white blood cell count, leukocytosis or a high white blood cell count often leads to a poor prognosis. And then there are a large list of other tests as well, including abdominal x-ray, which can show clonic dilatation in the case of toxic megacolon. There can also be sigmoidoscopy and colonoscopy, which can be used to visualize pseudomembranes. These are pseudomembranes here, these yellow plaques within the colon. A sigmoidoscopy or colonoscopy should not be performed if it has been shown that the patient has colonic dilatation. A barium enema is not oftentimes going to be used, but if it is, it can show a serrated appearance with a patient who has C. diff colitis. And then CT abdo pelvis can be utilized in more severe cases where there is potentially fulminant colitis, for instance. Once a clinician has diagnosed a C. diff infection, how do they treat it? So it's important to stop the problematic antibiotic. If they are on, for instance, clindamycin, it should be stopped. If they're on a fluoroquinolone, that should be stopped. And there should also be adequate fluid resuscitation. Oftentimes, patients may be dehydrated. Because a lot of those tests we talked about in the last slide can take time for results to come back, oftentimes patients may be started on treatment empirically. So a clinician from looking at the history and physical examination of the patient may decide that this patient likely has C. diff and will start the patient on treatment even before those results come back. Some of the treatments for C. diff include metronidazole. So metronidazole is an antibiotic that is used to oftentimes treat anaerobic infections. So this one has been noted to help with a C. diff infection. Clinicians will often have a regimen of 500 milligrams TID or three times a day for 10 days. Metronidazole is going to be used in more milder cases. Vancomycin PO, which means by mouth, can be used in some cases. So the regimen for vancomycin PO is often going to be 125 milligrams QID or four times a day for 10 to 14 days. This is going to be more likely to occur in severe, complicated, or treatment failure cases. Treatment failure cases meaning that they may have tried metronidazole, it didn't work, and then they move on to vancomycin PO. Vancomycin is often used in IV formulation for other infections because it doesn't cross membranes easily. But in the case of a C. diff infection, because it's in the gastrointestinal tract, taking vancomycin PO is no problem because it can stay in the gastrointestinal tract. It doesn't have to diffuse past the gastrointestinal mucosa and get into the blood. So PO vancomycin can be used in a C. diff infection. Fidaxomycin is also another treatment that can be used in more mild to moderate cases. And then there may be times where a patient is put on IV metronidazole with PO vancomycin. So having both treatments attacking the C. diff from outside of the gastrointestinal tract and inside the gastrointestinal tract. And this is going to occur in very severe cases or cases with an ileus or toxic megacolon. And in some cases, vancomycin may be given per rectum as well. So in some very severe cases, this can often be the regimen for treating it. And in some very severe cases, there may be a requirement for surgical intervention. And surgical intervention in this case is a subtotal colectomy, so removal of parts of the colon. And this is going to occur with those who have fulminant colitis. This is going to be very important because fulminant colitis is an important cause of death in patients with a C. diff infection. And then some newer therapies that can be used include bacterial therapy or a fecal microbiota transplant. This is going to be used often in the case of recurrent 
C. difficile infection. And it's oftentimes going to occur at or after the third recurrence. If a patient has been tried on many different treatments to get rid of C. diff, but they still keep having, they still keep having recurrent episodes, they can often be tried on bacteriotherapy or fecal microbiota transplant. This is where gut bacteria from a donor, for instance, the patient's partner or spouse, is transplanted into the patient through a nasogastric or NG tube. So this is another way of treating a C. diff infection. If you want to learn more about other infectious diseases, please check out my infectious disease playlist. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thank you so much for watching and hope to see you next time.